All right, so I have the pleasure of introducing Jeremy Lasky, who is an entrepreneur and a creative leader who started his career at RGA. Uh, in the fall of 2001, Jeremy co-founded Perception, which is a cutting-edge motion graphic studio that led the revolution in creating groundbreaking design and visual effects on the desktop. Uh, it has now become a global leader in designing uh, futuristic UIs for both feature films and the most powerful brands in technology. Now, um, Jeremy provided a list of where his work was featured, and it's long and distinguished, and it's longer than the two pages that I have up here. Uh, but need needless to say, that it's prominent and prolific. And when I was talking to him earlier, too, he did mention, he said to me, I'm an outsider. And I said, no, we have plenty of outside speakers here. Uh, and what he meant was he's actually not in healthcare and life sciences. So it's going to be a very interesting, uh, fresh perspective, I think, that Jeremy's going to give us. Jeremy. Can you guys hear me OK? All right. Thank you guys so much. Thank you for the great introduction. My name is Jeremy Lasky. I'm a founder and co-owner of Perception, as, uh, as you guys just heard. We're a design and visual effects studio in New York City. And we have a very unique focus. Uh, on the left here, we design futuristic interfaces for movies. We design stuff for Tony Stark and Iron Man, for the Avengers, for Captain America, for Robocop. But th then on the right, we also design for real-world technology companies. So technology giants like IBM and Samsung and Microsoft have come to us because of our unique cinematic vision and trying to take that science fiction uh, vision of the future and actually using it in real-world products. So we live in this parallel world of science fiction and science fact. You can see some of the movies we've been working on in the last few years. We actually just finished Batman vs. Superman. Uh, but all the film work is really centered around visualizing futuristic technology. I put together a very brief montage to give you guys a visual sense of what some of this work looks like. Hopefully that gives you guys a little bit of a, an idea of what we do on a day-to-day -day basis. But I'm not here to, uh, to talk about perception. I'm here to talk to you guys about your world. And I'm endlessly fascinated by this idea of science fiction influencing science fact. It's something we're all well aware of. It's been well documented since the time of 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea and Jules Verne influencing the inventor of the submarine and, and uh, War of the Worlds influencing the inventor of the rocket ship. But what I thought would be really interesting is to talk about uh, medical innovations that we've already seen for decades in films and science fiction. So before I get into that, let's start with this notion of the science fiction feedback loop. The science fiction feedback loop begins with this idea of a technological climate. And a technological climate is society's appreciation for and understanding of what is technologically achievable by today's standards. It's that collective understanding that we all have of knowing what's possible by by today's technology uh, means. If we go too far ahead of that, we create confusion. So we want to always blend the science present and the science future together. To put this in a visual diagram, the, technological f uh, the science fiction feedback loop begins where science fiction is made reflecting the current climate. So artists, writers, thinkers, filmmakers look around them, see what's possible by society standards, and they take a quantum leap forward and they make the movie, they write the story that pushes the, the society's vision of the future ahead. 
That then gets absorbed into the technological climate. In other words, we all go see Minority Report or we read these stories and we all start getting very excited about what the future might bring and that inspires the collective imagining of all of us. Eventually, technology reaches a point where we can create what was once only in the movies and that then gets absorbed into the technological climate and everything kind of shifts forward again and the loop begins brand new. So then the next generation of thinkers, artists, and writers have to think ahead into what's what the future might look like. And it's this endless loop of inspire, create, and repeat. So let's talk about some parallel worlds in medicine. Parallel world number one is virtual and augmented reality. So for, for decades we've seen movies depicting characters wearing magical glasses and goggles from Star Trek to even James Bond wearing x-ray glasses. In more recent uh, years we've seen characters being able to interact with holograms like Tony Stark and Avatar. There was even a show called Firefly, if you guys remember this, that actually depicted holographic surgery. Well, today there's a company called Real View Surgery in Israel that's actually using holograms and open heart surgery. We're seeing Google Glass being used in the operating room. Here a, a doctor at Ohio University is actually conferencing in a colleague who couldn't physically be there during this procedure. The Fraunhofer Institute has invented an, an app for augmented reality that's being used in surgery where, he, where the doctor can actually hold the iPad over the surgical site and it will overlay a diagram of veins and arteries where he should or should not make incisions over the live video. Sony's HMZ T2 is a heads up display that actually can put the point of view of, a, of an endoscopic camera in the line of vision during a, a laparoscopic surgery. The VV heads up display is this new device that just came out that actually puts a patient's vital signs just in the line of sight of the doctor. The uh, eyes on down there on the lower left is by a company called Avena and these lenses and these cameras actually help nurses see through patient's skin in order to pinpoint exactly where to put the, uh, the needle when they're drawing blood or giving injections. The anatomage dissection table is being used in medical schools right now using 3D images taken from CT scans of the body. Students are doing virtual dissections. And then the eye knife down there is actually a, a cyber knife that can detect cancer cells just by the smell of the smoke as it's cutting through different layers of tissue. Parallel world number two, body scanners and wearable sensors. So perhaps the most famous wearable of all is Dick Tracy's smartwatch. We all remember that. I grew up watching a Knight Rider and Michael Knight and his, his watch being able to communicate with Kit. We've seen smartwatches in James Bond movies. We've seen wearables from Minority Report to the almighty power glove in the 80s classic The Wizard. Uh, perhaps one of the best wearables that I can remember is growing up watching The Greatest American Hero, which is about a high school teacher who gets a super suit and when he puts it on he becomes a superhero. When he takes it off he's just an average ordinary high school teacher. It's a great show. Um, and then scanners. Of course the most famous scanner is the, tri is the Star Trek tricorder device. And today we have the Scanadu Scout. And the Scanadu Scout, in 10 seconds, hold, held up to a patient's forehead, can return all sorts of key vital signs. We have the Biosign Health Monitor, which uses four channels of incoming data to measure 10 biological stats. We have the Eye Health Glucometer, which takes and logs measurements anywhere and can view trends for spans of 7, 14, 30, or even 90 days. Medtronic's pancreas is the first of its kind in the United States and has the capability to automatically stop insulin delivery when blood glucose levels are either too high or too low. And the PillCam SB2 is an ingestible camera that doctors can track and monitor as it goes throughout the bowel for lesions and ulcers and, and so on. Then there's this Bluetooth sensor, which is in China, I believe, and it's actually an artificial tooth that's embedded into the mouth that al allows doctors to monitor the patient's oral hygiene habits. And then lower left here, we have these two adhesive wearables. There's a smart tattoo now that can measure athletes' pH levels in their sweat, and this uh, adhesive thermometer that has uh, unprecedented um, accuracy in measuring a body temperature. Let's talk about wearables. We have the Reebok check light, which is being used now in the NFL. It's a skull cap to measure G-force to the brain to hopefully prevent concussions, which is obviously very newsworthy right now. Uh, and then companies like Radiate, Hexoskin, Athos, and Hi-Toe are developing these high-tech garments for fitness enthusiasts and trainers and athletes that can actually, actually measure and monitor all sorts of vital statistics during a, a training and working out. Uh, and of course, they all feed into uh, to iPhone apps and so forth. 
Radiate actually changes colors depending upon the, the level of activity of the athlete. And miraculously, these are all machine washable. Uh, let's talk about uh, the next one, surgical robots. Um, we've seen robots in surgery in science fiction movies in the 70s from Logan's Run, Woody Allen's Sleeper, uh, threw in Star Wars because of this week, but uh, Darth Vader was actually operated on by robots in Revenge of the Sith. Very famous scene in Prometheus, which had a, uh, a surgical chamber that was all robot driven. Ender's Game was actually filmed at the University of Washington using a real uh, robot surgical unit called the Raven 2. Well, we're all very familiar with the Da Vinci made by Intuitive Surgical, which is an incredible innovation, and, and that's being used uh, with, with incredible precision. The V-Bot combines the latest in robotics and imaging technology to ultimately speed up the process of drawing blood or inserting IVs. We're seeing medical drones now being used to fly in medical supplies in hard-to-reach areas during times of humanitarian crises. DARPA has a trauma pod, which is going to enhance battlefield casualty care through the integration of telerobotic and robotic medical systems. Then we have two telepresence robots up there. One is the Acute Care RP Vita, which is the first FDA cleared telemedicine robot using auto drive technology, allowing doctors to make the rounds without even physically having to be there. And then the Telenoid R1, which is admittedly a little creepy, uh, is a human like remote controlled android that's using audio and movement transmitters through which doctors can relay messages over long distances. And then the last one on that screen, the bottom right, is the ARIES, which stands for Assembling Reconfigurable Endoluminal Surgical System, which is an ingestible robot swallowed in pieces that assembles itself in the body and then can then move throughout the system. This is all science fiction to me, guys. <laughs> Uh, the fourth parallel world is creation, growing organs in petri dishes and 3D printing. Again, one of my favorite shows growing up was The Six Million Dollar Man about Steve Austin, an astronaut who in a terrible accident loses both legs and arm and an eye and then of course the spin-off was The Bionic Woman. She also loses the arm and both legs but instead of the eye she lost her hearing so she gets bionic hearing. Uh, we've seen 3D printing of bodies and parts in movies like The Fifth Element and last summer's Avengers Age of Ultron. Darkman depicted uh, skin being able to be printed. So now, uh, growing uh, organs in petri dishes, let's start off with that uh, heart valve, which is done at the University of California in Irvine, where they're developing heart valves using patients' own cells with a metal alloy for a more durable replacement with potentially fewer complications. We have kidneys being grown in dishes using pluripotent stem cells and embryonic stem cells. This is being done at the University of Washington, and they're starting clinical trials with that. Uh, scientists from Wake Forest are growing uh, bladders in, in, the, in the lab and successfully transplanting them into people. Uh, the University of College London is growing ears, uh, blood vessels and windpipes in petri dishes. A company called OxyBio is printing 3D tissue that's being used in organ repair and replacement. And my alma mater, Carnegie Mellon, is printing 3D arteries uh, using MRI images of coronary arteries in consumer level printers. They're actually uh, printing these things into a supportive gel so they don't collapse upon themselves uh, once they're printed. Then uh, 3D printing of prosthetics. We're seeing these neuroprosthetics which actually give the patient a sense of feel. We're seeing prosthetics being controlled with the mind. Stanford is actually uh, creating this artificial skin that actually has a sense to it that, that patients can actually feel it when they're touched. Cornell University is printing spinal discs for anybody with spinal issues like myself. We're seeing cochlear implants uh, helping the, the deaf to hear. Second Sight uh, is a company that's developed retinal implants to restore vision to the blind or people with age-related macular degeneration. There's something called a skin gun, which is actually for burn victims that's using a patient's own skin cells to repair burns in record time. And then the BioPen is actually at the University of Wollongong and it's their 3D printing directly onto bone. Fifth parallel world, brains and computers. We've seen uh, movies depicting this idea of interfacing directly with computers for, for decades. In the 70s, The Terminal Man, it was a story by Michael Crichton originally, then it was a movie, depicted a man who had sensors embedded in his brain that was then connected to a computer for them to control these seizures. Movies like Captain America 2 and Transcendence depicted characters actually achieving immortality by uploading their entire consciousness to computers. Great film in the 80s, Brainstorm, if no one's seen it, uh, Christopher Walken, they create these helmets that actually record memories and that anyone who wears these helmets can actually relive those memories as if they were their own. So now, 
Let's start with the NeuroGrid at Stanford, where they've been working on a circuit board that mimics the behavior of the human brain, which can replicate the processes of a million human neurons, resulting in computer chips that are 9,000 times faster than a desktop computer. The Muse is a headband, you can order that now on Amazon just in time for Christmas, that actually measures brain waves of, uh, of your meditation. Duke is uh, developing these brain machine interfaces with animals called brain nets where they can actually network multiple animals together uh, to work as part of a single system. Kevin Warwick is a British engineer most famous for Project Cyborg. He's known for his studies on direct interfaces between computer systems and the human nervous system and he's also done research in the field of robotics. Brain implants are a technological device connecting directly to the subject's brain to help circumvent areas that have become dysfunctional after a stroke or other head injuries. We have the NeuroBridge, which is a system that allows the brain to bypass the site of an injury, like the spinal cord, and sending it directly to a muscle that it needs to control. The Human Brain Project in the European Commission aims at building completely new computing infrastructure for neuroscience and brain-related research. And then optogenetics is a biological technique involving the use of light to control cells and living tissue, typically neurons in the brain, for more precise manipulation than implanted electrodes or drugs. My sixth parallel world is exoskeletons and Iron Man suits. Of course, our hero Iron Man, we were all very familiar with that. But in uh, movies dating back to Alien, we've seen these exoskeletons being used by characters to enhance strength and, and other abilities. And now we have companies like uh, Exobionics and Rewalk that's actually using these exoskeletons to restore mobility to people who are paralyzed. We have defense giants like Raytheon and Lockheed Martin that are building exoskeletons for soldiers on the battlefield to enhance their, their speed, their strength, their uh, agility. Bespoke Innovations is a really interesting company. They're 3D printing panels over prosthetics to give uh, that more customized personal feel for, for, for those folks who have to wear them. BioDAPT actually makes uh, prosthetics with an emphasis on extreme sports. And Biomechatronics is the MIT Media Lab group aiming to restore function to individuals who have impaired mobility and the developing technologies to augment human performance. The last parallel world is nanorobot technology. We've seen this in, in movies from Iron Man 3 to Transcendence, they the Earth is still even Star Trek. But the one that started it all was Fantastic Voyage, based on the 1966 story by Otto Clement, where scientists reduce themselves to microscopic levels and get injected into the body in order to, uh, to solve the, the issue of the patient. Now we're seeing nanorobot technology come to life. Uh, the, the buckyball is the atomic building block for nanotechnology. It's being held up by a doctor at the Cleveland Clinic where they just recently launched a partnership with Hebrew University to develop cures for some of the world's most threatening diseases. The clotocyte nanorobot functions similarly to platelets in our blood by dispersing fibers, creating clots in a fraction of the time the platelets do. The gold nanoparticle is being developed at Rice University and MD Anderson, which are, they're injected into cancer patients, and then when light is shown on them, they actually heat up and destroy cancer cells. The European Tech Platform is a group of 53 stakeholders that are leading the charge towards nanotechnology-based diagnostics, targeted drug delivery, and regenerative medicine. The nanofiber gel is also at Rice University, and using uh, snake venom and this nanofiber, they're creating a very potent coagulant. And then lastly, the Max Planck Institute is a team of Israeli and German scientists who've come up with the world's smallest propeller, that's a propeller, that actually can get uh, nano nanobots into the smallest possible uh, places in the body. So I know I'm running out of time. Final thoughts. Like I said, this all feels like science fiction to me. I've been sharing th this information for the last month with friends, colleagues, uh, coworkers, and no one could believe that m any of this stuff was actually happening. I, I can't believe uh, what I just showed you guys, but I'm sure you're all very familiar with most of it. But really, there's an amazing future ahead. Uh, we're living in a time of continuous disruption. There's inspiration all around us from movies, books, and stories, and innovations from other industries. I love the idea that 3D printing technology is being used in medicine, and robot innovations are coming to medicine, and all this stuff is just starting to, uh, to cross-pollinate across all of these different worlds. But while we have to embrace this technological advancement, we can't lose that human touch. And that's always the fear, is that as things accelerate, we're going to lose sight of, of, of the humanity in it. And that doctor-patient relationship is crucial uh, to maintain. And it's this notion that I talk about a lot at, at my job, this notion of soul. And we design interfaces all the time for companies, but we always talk about keeping the soul in it, keeping the human touch in it. And that's really what design is about, is that this always has to feel like it was created by a human being and it's being used for, uh, for a human being. So thank you guys very much. Really enjoyed being here.
little social media plug. Are there any questions for Jeremy? Uh, thanks, that was really uh, very interesting. I'm curious, um, to what extent is it uh, in your company's best interest to keep abreast of all these technologies so that you bring that into the work you do for companies or for, uh, for movies? We're always looking at, at technological advancements in all industries. So, uh, you know, my, my team is really composed of, uh, I want to say, geeks. Um, but the filmmakers are drawn to us because we bring a level of authenticity to the movies. And the real technology companies are drawn to us because we do the science fiction. So it's sort of like this, uh, it's another feedback loop. And in a way, each parallel world wants what the other one has. The filmmakers want the stuff in the movies to look as real and authentic as possible. And then companies like IBM, Samsung, and Microsoft tell us, make this look like Iron Man. Make it look like a movie. So the real wants to look fake, and the fake wants to look real. It's kind of uh, interesting. But the, the more we have a grasp on what is going on, the more we can bring that authenticity into what we do. Other questions? Oh. One right here. So you probably have a preview of a lot of new movies coming out. So what's the, I was going to say, you probably have a preview of a lot of new movies coming out, doing what you do. So anything we haven't seen yet that we can look forward to? Like Star Wars or something? Uh, I haven't seen Star Wars yet, but I'm looking forward to it. Um, we just finished the next Batman, which is actually Batman v Superman, which is DC's they're, they're kind of going into this whole Justice League thing, uh, and that's really good. It's coming out in March. But I worked on it, so I'm a little biased. <laughs> well, thank you guys so much. It was a pleasure. Thanks, My pleasure. <laughs>